So our second speaker for today is Dr. Len Tessarero. Len is a visiting scientist with the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries based at the Central Coast Primary Industries Centre. And Len today is talking about tomato canker risk mitigation strategies. So Len, we've got your notes pages there. Do you want to just try switching your display settings so we can oh, just at the top okay. there? Happy and then again. we should see your, there we go. All good. Perfect, it's all yours. Okay. Well, hello everybody. Um, I'll be talking about tomato canker or bacterial canker of tomatoes. And it's probably one of the most important diseases in greenhouse tomatoes. Um, it also affects field crops, but um, it's certainly uh, a pretty important one. And it seems to affect growers right at the top end in the really um, uh, high technology houses, right down to the middle and the lower technology houses. So it affects everybody. And one of the main reasons is that it's uh, transmitted by seed. Uh, it's got a worldwide distribution. And as you know, we, we probably import virtually all of our greenhouse tomato seed. Um, and the problem is that the low initial infection amplifies during seedling production, particularly during grafting. And it survives on farms for long periods of time if you, and it's very difficult to eradicate. It's spread with water, contaminated equipment and, and handling. And because it has this, uh, I guess, long latent phase, growers won't realise they've actually got the disease until it um, manifests as um, the plants start to mature. There's some genetic uh, resistance, but really nothing really that's come through with robust uh, commercial resistance. The typical symptoms are wilting. As you can see there on the slide on the left, those mature plants, generally when they're the fruit are filling and, and you're getting photoassimilates moving uh, into the fruit, the plants are, are quite stressed and you get that uh, leaf symptom and wilting. If you look inside the stem, uh, in many cases, you'll get sort of a honey colour and, and uh, pale brown vascular tissue. Uh, and the cortex I've found, particularly in greenhouse varieties, tends to break away very easily and you get that sort of porousy look inside. Uh, that symptom on the leaves they call firing, and that's very typical in greenhouses, probably not so typical in the field. And you also get um, sometimes much darker vascular tissue, which gets confusing with things like Fusarium wilt disease. So just be careful with um, uh, jumping to conclusions about some of these things. Uh, bacterial canker also has some variable symptoms and that bird's eye spotting, which is quite typical on the right, you probably mostly see in field crops where there's moisture on the fruit. You can sometimes get these V-shaped lesions in the center there, where the infection occurs through the edge of the leaf. And sometimes uh, those little tiny cankers, which are almost, you know, you wouldn't really notice them so much, but uh, little tiny cankers occur on the, um, on the uh, leaf itself. In terms of development, as I said, it starts as a symptomless infection, what we call an endophyte. So it actually moves into the vascular tissue up the xylem. And there's this thing in bacteria called quorum sensing. So when you get the bacteria multiplying in the xylem, when, when there's about 100 million bacteria per, per gram of tissue, it, they start to secrete enzymes that break down the cell walls. And that's when the symptoms really start to develop. It produces toxins and it also clogs those xylem vessels. So that leads to the wilting symptoms. And it can survive in plant material for up to two years. So that's why it's really important to get on to sanitation and hygiene. In terms of management, so obviously exclusion of um, getting the virus, the fungus, the virus, the bacteria into your to your crop uh, using clean seed. And in Europe, they use this good seed 
uh, plant practice, so the GSPP, where they test a lot of seed. And, uh, and so that practice is, is used quite widely in Europe. So um, the Europeans seem uh, to be very careful about their tomato seed. And again, because there's a lot of high technology greenhouse, in particularly in Northern Europe, they're very conscious of uh, not having bacterial canker into their farm. Farm hygiene is obviously important, water disinfection is important, and personal hygiene and PPE are important. And I put that picture there because I took that photo of a farm, and you can see the leaking um, disinfectant in that wheat, uh, in that mat. And uh, that's just a, a, an example of where people make an attempt to do something, but in the end, maybe it's not so effective. Another approach people have used is trying to clean up when I talk about um, keeping good hygiene. Sweeping the floor uh, sometimes can also spread pathogens. And in this case, uh, there's, you can see those wilting plants in the foreground. Managing plant waste is another thing. And I know with a lot of greenhouses, particularly where they've used using encarsia to control white flies, they like to put the leaves down on the, in between the rows. And, uh, and that can be very dangerous for uh, spreading bacterial canker when people are walking over those plant parts and, uh, and spreading the disease around. Uh, I took this picture in, uh, in California, and so you can see it's a very high technology greenhouse, but you can see there that they've not managed their waste very well, and any pathogen, any plant pathogen, is going to blow back into the greenhouse um, uh, or be picked up by equipment um, as they go past. So, um, you know, making sure you do the right thing, yes, using um, uh, bins to put the uh, crop waste into uh, is important, but doing it properly is important. So crop hygiene, as I just said, is probably one of the most important things. Uh, removing of, of plants and, and setting up quarantine zones if you do have an outbreak is very important. And that's been shown to be effective in, on some farms where they've had uh, issues with bacterial canker if they notice it early enough. Uh, disinfection and, and sanitation of tools, machinery and stuff. So, um, I've done quite a bit of work on looking at different disinfectants, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, removing pruned leaves directly into bins, as I was saying in the previous slide, um, and not just putting them on the floor, I think is pretty important for this disease in particular. Solarisation of greenhouses between crops is another thing that can be used. Uh, it is important, though, that remembering the bacteria are internal as well as external on the leaf material or the stem material. So you need to make sure that um, there's moisture there so that the temperature can penetrate. Uh, there is a thing that is called plasmid curing, where the plasmid, which is the part of the bacterial genome that has the important bits for uh, the actual disease expression, uh, stops replicating at about 32 degrees. Now, that's not really going to solve your problem completely, but getting the temperature up as warm as you can uh, in the greenhouse between crops is a good way of trying to minimise the survival of the, the canker pathogen. In terms of uh, research questions and other management options, uh, one of the problems I found with uh, copper products was that uh, a lot of the strains of bacteria in particular, this uh, bacterial canker pathogen, have actually become quite tolerant to copper. And I know that in the United States, they, they have formulations of copper with zinc chloride. And that's very similar to where people used to use copper plus mancozeb, uh, where it makes the copper ions um, more soluble and, and therefore more active against the bacteria. Uh, plant defence activators. We we did some experimental work a few years ago with these salicylates, um, the salicylic acid derivatives, and found that they were quite useful. Uh, unfortunately, we 
don't have any products registered uh, at this stage. Also looked at some of the soluble silicates. Um, I didn't find that they were very effective, but again, I think more work is required in this area. It's also known that lysozyme, an, an enzyme, dissolves the bacterial walls. And I always intended that if we had a project, we'd look at that, but we've never really managed to get a new project uh, to go that far. In North America, they have viruses that actually attack this particular bacteria called bacteriophages. And that's another potential option that we could explore in, in new research. Um, one downside of that approach might be that uh, the bacteriophages can be very, very specific. So they might only work against certain strains of the bacteria. So it's important that more research is done in that area. And then there's beneficial bacteria, and there are products on the market in Australia with bacillus subtilis or other bacillus species that might help to suppress uh, the, the uh, bacterial canker organism. In terms of sanitation and disinfection of the greenhouses, removing those plants and crop debris, I've always wondered whether vacuuming might be an alternative, trying to get rid of all that organic material, particularly along uh, pathways. Um, there's always, I've noticed, um, uh, a little area just next to the path where sometimes uh, dirt accumulates, sometimes below weed matting. Um, washing with soapy hot water and preferably high pressure cleaners are really important. In, and that's really important in that cleanup phase at the end of the crop. So removing all that organic matter and using uh, detergents and, uh, and heat uh, to start to get rid of um, some of these bacteria. All types of disinfectants are useful. So we've looked at the full range really of dis dis disinfectants on the market, but some are better than others. Um, uh, Cherie mentioned in her talk one that I don't think is available in Australia, unfortunately, that was very effective. That was that um, Menos florides. And some have fewer side effects, so some are known to be corrosive. So most growers who have used these disinfectants would know which ones have got those sorts of problems. Uh, but as I said, they're all effective. It's just that they need to be, uh, it's a time and concentration factor. So you need to uh, expose the surfaces for long enough and remembering that the disinfectants, um, they react with organic molecule, molecules. So they'll only surface sterilise, they won't actually penetrate uh, organic matter. So you, you're not going to get, uh, if you've got a piece of stem or something on the, on the floor and you use a disinfectant, it won't actually kill the bacteria that are well inside that stem. Things like cutting tools, we found that you really need sometimes up to 10 minutes to kill these microbes. So when using knives, um, have a few pairs and rotate them every um, after you've used them on a few plants. Using good quality metal blades is important as well. Um, I found a reference from overseas and we repeated it that good metal blades have smoother surfaces and uh, there's little pits in, the, in older blades or in poorer quality blades and the disinfectant doesn't always get into those little pits inside the metal. So, it's important to have good quality there. And then replacing disinfectants, and that's important, whether it's um, in foot baths or in uh, uh, cutting tool uh, 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 containers, uh, because, because these disinfectants actually uh, react with organic matter, they start to degrade, so you need to replace them frequently. So early detection and laboratory confirmation is important. Um, I found these immunotest strips useful, but they can give false positive reactions. Um, there's another symptom there, that one on the left, that marbling of the fruit is another symptom that can uh, uh, be associated with uh, bacterial canker. Um, so I think that's probably um, where I'll finish it there. Thank you.